Hi, this is Randy Randall of No Age and host of the podcast Hyphen It with Randy Randall. I want to welcome our newest sponsor of the show, DistroKid. DistroKid helps musicians get their music on all the major streaming platforms and artists keep 100% of their royalties. Hyphenate listeners get 30% off at distrokid.com backslash VIP backslash hyphenate. Again, that's distrokid.com backslash VIP backslash H-Y-P-H-E-N-A-T-E. Go get your music streaming everywhere now. Yes! What is happening? Happy Thursday morning to everybody. Thursday afternoon, Thursday, whatever day it is, even if your Thursday is a uh, Friday, I guess, right? That happens sometimes. Uh, I'm coming to you from sunny Southern California. I hope everybody else is staying warm as if they can out there in the world. I know things are going to start to warm up here eventually in most parts, or might still be extra snowy, icy where you're at. Just stay warm. I am very excited. Uh, today's show, I was very lucky enough to have Mr. Uh, Pat Graham, incredible photographer, Pat Graham, um, be on the show. He very kindly sat down with me via the computer. He was coming to me from uh, uh, London, England, and uh, he runs a gallery there. And he sells prints. If you don't know Pat, um, he is responsible for some of the most iconic images in independent music, you know, of bands like Fugazi, Bikini Kill, uh, Modest Mouse. He uh, is an incredible photographer and was really, you know, the right place at the right time, but also with an incredible talent and an eye and a uh, working camera. <laughs> like my co-host on the halftime hyphen, it says Aaron Farley, you know, he, he got to be, go to a lot of shows, but just the pictures all came out blurry. He was shooting something and didn't, didn't have the right, uh, lens on the right, uh, something. I don't know. I am definitely not a photographer. I spent a lot of years with uh, disposable cameras and had pictures of my finger, <laughs> blurry finger in front of the lens. Um, but yeah, I mean, photography was such a different world, you know, pre digital cameras in our pockets and, uh, platforms like Instagram and other things to, uh, to share photos. I still remember the, um, the blog spot era, you know, uh, no age has a blog spot, blog spot, <laughs> blog spot that's still up there that we would, uh, I remember having to put, to take pictures with my point and shoot, you know, kind of digital camera. And then that night after the show or, or after dinner from the day before, try to, uh, if they had Wi-Fi, download all the pictures onto a hard drive and then from the hard drive upload at like, you know, glacier speeds. Like so, it took so long to get, uh, photos up to these blogs and then try to write something quippy or witty or something up there. And then, uh, and then that was it. I just kind of live forever. I know there's been some funny, uh, archival, Stuff if you go through, you know, I think Photo Bucket or uh, Shutter. I don't know what it was. What's the other one? There was a few. There's still a few like, you know, vintage photo places there. I'm sure they're going out of business or the server spaces is closing down. But if you have any photos up there, you should go and uh, try to download them all before it goes away. And also, you can find lots of lots of 20 year old photos of parties and dumb stuff. Definitely pre. Pre Instagram was a different world, pre social media, a very different world of taking photos. But we go back decades before that, even. And uh, when I'm talking to uh, uh, Pat here, we're looking at the uh, late 80s, uh, early 90s through the end of the 90s, into the 2000s. Um, Pat was, was all over the map and taking his camera wherever he went and captured so many great photos. It had become iconic. So it was really an honor to speak with Pat. Um, yeah, I want to thank everybody for uh, for being here with me on this fun journey. I'm having fun doing these once a week interviews now with the uh, the halftime wrap up shows every Monday with Aaron Farley. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for listening. And if you feel feel free to uh, give me five stars wherever you're listening to this, Apple iTunes or wherever they are, Apple Pods, Spotify, rate the show five stars. 
<laughs> five thumbs up, <laughs> however many thumbs up you can fit in there. And uh, yeah, leave a good review. It helps somehow let the robots know that we're out here doing this and recommends it to other people. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out at half and eight, half time, half and eight, hyphenate half time at gmail.com. I think that's the best email address for me. Or you can find me uh, on the Instagram uh, interweb feeds at uh, Randy S. Randall. Um, yeah, it's usually where I post about the show, but feel free to, uh, to get hold of me. Let me know who you think I should interview. If you yourself are a hyphenate and think you are very interesting and would want to talk, I'm totally up uh, for finding more guests via that way. Feel free to pitch yourself, your your dorky friends, your mom, your brother, your cousins. I'd like to know. Tell me a story. Tell me who these people are. Tell me why I should talk to them. I would love to meet new people. I mean, obviously, most of these people I'm kind of getting through um, music art creative world of people I know, which it's at some point I'm sure, you know, those, those lists will, will, uh, have to start repeating people, but, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm having fun doing it. I think it's great. So again, thank you. Hit me up hyphenate halftime at gmail.com and, uh, yeah, leave a good review. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Bye bye. Wow. Pat Graham, welcome to Hyphenate. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me here. Well, thank you so much for having me. I was uh, yeah, fascinated to see what you, who you had interviewed already, and I'm honored to be um, thought of anywhere near your esteemed no. guests so far. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, you're, right, you're right there in the pocket of people I, w- I would love to mm. talk to. Um, so yeah, the idea of the show is I talk to people who are, who are prolific in more than one medium, and obviously you're best known as a photographer, but I do feel that like in looking at your biography and the, and the scope of your work, I think sometimes hyphenation happens chronologically over, over life as well as not just you know simultaneously where you're one person wearing 10 different hats at a time, but over a life and a career. You can you can transform and, and hyphenate your interests and profession within even a scope. I mean, I, l- I think looking at you as a, as a publisher, as a book publisher, and as a gallery owner, as well as a photographer, I think sort of qualifies in that regard. Does that does that sort of ring true with you? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think um, I think especially people are realizing more now days that as a creative or as doing things in a creative medium, you really have to think on your feet and kind of spread spread out and touch different aspects of what you want to do and try to relate it to to come back to where you started from. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I I I sort of think of you or look at you as a um, you know, sort of a, as it along the side of, of, you know, DIY godfathers, you know, within the music scene, but also, you know, your documentation, I think is the way a lot of us, a lot of the audiences are witness to the, the, you know, the scene in DC as well as, you know, uh, modest mouse and, and, you know, many other DIY local scenes. I mean, was that, you know, we'll, we'll do a biography. We'll get back from the start there, but I guess just in terms of when you, when you talk about, you know, creative diversification and going out and implanting yourself with a band on the road and planting yourself in inside of a scene, was there an early sort of motivation to do that? Were you, how aware, I guess the question, I'll simplify, how aware were you at the time that you were, you know, creating a, a, you know, the look of something that would be passed down for generations? Um, not very aware, but <laughs> <laughs> honestly, you know, like when I, um, I loved photography. I love photography. I love music. And I thought, oh, and punk rock. And they all just seem to go well together. So um, in my head, I, I wanted to share that. I wanted to somehow try to share that feeling with others and so that was really my short-term goal. And then what followed on from that would be uh, particular musicians and performers, or, you know, musicians, bands, who really inspired me and caused me to want to keep taking their photo because I felt like I never got the right shot, I guess I would, you know, you'd say. And um, through doing that, if I did feel like I got something I like, I would 
give it to the musician and you know usually it turned out a lot of my friends ended up being musicians and that's how I you know became involved with all these different things but it all came back to photography and the fact that I was documenting what they were doing and loved music even though I wasn't a musician myself so it's um, yeah. It's incredible. I wonder, you know, with, with some of your images, you know, of, of Kathleen Hanna, of Ian McKay, of Guy Pichotto, uh, Isaac Brock, Johnny Marr, how, how much of it is you saying this is the photo, this is the frame, or is it the, the musician themselves picking it or the fans picking it? I'm just, I guess I'm thinking as my, as a musician myself, sometimes you write a song, you put a whole, you write a whole bunch of songs, you put a record out and you think, you know what the, the, the single is, or the, you know, the, the spotlight track that people are going to focus on. And sometimes they'll find something else. And so there's that, there is a dialogue with you and your audience in, in terms of being a musician of people picking the things like are the images that we know most you know associate with with you and, and I, you know looking at, at the big cartel like some of these kind of iconic photos are they ones that you selected or or is there a process that kind of informs around that like I guess do you do you know when you take the photo or is it revealed to you over time yeah that's a good question I think it's uh, it's definitely revealed to me over time I would say um, occasionally once in a great while I think it, maybe it's mm -hmm. happened once or twice that I can think of in particular where in my head I know I'm like, well, that's the shot, at least for me, that's the wow. shot. And it is it is interesting, though, because it's uh, I'm finding out now because I've been doing a lot of uh, scanning of my old work, kind of rediscovering things thanks to technology, which we can talk about that more yeah. in a little bit. But, um, yeah, it is definitely it's a collaboration with the best shots that I've gotten of performer of the musicians it's you know, it's a co collaboration so yeah maybe i would show them i wouldn't show them that much or i would show them first of all what i liked and then they would choose something from that and you know lots of times there would be selects that i didn't i wouldn't have chosen but then i can learn something from them because they're just as creative you know like um working with um, at the moment i've just finished a, a book with um johnny marr of all of his instruments kind of like a biography of him through his instruments and wow. photographs i took of the instruments and you know so i took I know, thousands of photos of over a hundred of his instruments and basically gave him my selects and then he went through and designed a whole book with another uh guy matt bancroft and yeah, you know, it's a little nerve wracking, but I trust his his vision, his eye, and you know what he did or what he saw with my photos, I didn't see, and that really kind of blew me away. And that's to me, that's really exciting when that happens. If you get the opportunity for that to happen, it doesn't always happen that way, but yeah. That's so cool. Yeah, just the collaborative sort of experience, which I think is obviously at the heart of, you know, bands, you know, these, these types of bands that you've captured. You know, it's... Um it is such a collaborative sort of thing within the band. And then you as a photographer kind of become this um, documentarian, but also very much part You're, you know, it looks like you're standing on the stage, you know, or at least very close to the stage. And as a musician, you know, as somebody in a band myself, like I, I'm aware of, of the people around you. And I think imagine at that time too, there, was there, was there, what was that like? And the discussions in terms of how close you could be or what was, you know, how it, was it, you know, a, a social relationship that didn't seem uncomfortable to, to, for the musicians to have you there with the yeah. camera in their face. Yeah. Well that at the time, I mean, this is a, a good, especially a, it's a interesting thing to look at now, especially the way uh, photography has become at gigs. Mm -hmm. So when I first started d taking the photographs at uh, the shows, my, you know, I had a few unwritten rules that I didn't tell anyone about, but they were in my <laughs> head. And one of them would be, you know, n not to, I didn't want to be the show. I didn't want to be interfering a with, with the audience trying to enjoy the band like I was. And I didn't want to take away from the band's performance by jumping up and getting in the way and flashing and all of that. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, which which work quite well a lot, of the, a lot of the time you know would get I would try to shoot in a stealth way like not in your face which was good at the time and in a lot of ways in, in ways it wasn't good because there were instances where I should have probably taken more photos or I should have taken a photo but I didn't feel comfortable because 
oh, there was three other people with cameras, and if I saw other people taking photos, when I was taking photos, I didn't want to be a part of that pack. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so that was tough. But nowadays, obviously, it's totally different. And, you know, back then, also, I wouldn't, I tended not to get on the stage. I wanted, I got the view from the front. And then finally, when I got over my shyness of that, and then started to get different angles, it got, it got kind of exciting. And then I had to learn to try to hide with within the stage and find the right areas and that's you know that was great i still do that now and my ears are still ringing right now and probably <laughs> will be for the rest of my life because of you know sitting next to jeremiah green's drums or oh, behind ian mckay's amp when he's feeding back or something you know <laughs> so um but yeah so i would try to basically just be out of the way i mean there's a really good Example, I guess, would be you know the the photographs I took of Bikini Kill that became used everywhere and became used on their their first EP. You know, they were friends, acquaintances of mine, and the people who founded Riot Girl were were really um, good friends of mine. And I was with them in the front, and mm -hmm. I was a guy, didn't move to the back, but I was out of the way, right? You know, and. Um, if you look closely in that shot of uh, Toby, you'll see my f a big patch of hair in the bottom of the frame. That's my friend who's a girl who's in front of me, you know, so <laughs> I try to respect that. But, yeah. you know, so I got photos and developed them and I gave them to the band and Kathleen said, oh, we're going to use this on our first EP. I'm like, oh, really? Great. And then it was done and I looked and they used the actual photo I gave them, the print, put it on a black piece of paper with their name above it and that was it <laughs> so. wow wow yeah, yeah that's, that's incredible cool. and i guess yeah and i guess that i mean that brings up an interesting question too i mean as as a photographer you own the image right but obviously you're you're you know peers and and amongst people so i mean you you can you give do you gift the photos to the band or what or at that time was it just sort of like i'll take them you use them for whatever you want but do you retain the rights to it is that yes that's a is that ever tricky it's or a hard good question or does that ever come back uh, yeah i it's, it's it's tricky because uh yeah when i set out i never i didn't in my mind i was it, i never thought of it as a a money making thing exercise it was just it was something else and then as we get older you know we all turn realize that unfortunately it has to be that way but um you know, so at the moment right now, I try to follow up and give, I'll give prints to the bands if they request them, or if I have extra copies, I get them to to the groups. Um, and yeah, they're definitely, uh, early on you learn that it, you know, it's good to make clear, you know, what you expect. If they're going to use it, you would hope that they would communicate to you how they would use it and you could discuss it further or or whatever. And for the most part, you know, I always, um, I'd do the same for the band respect. If it was a magazine or someone wanted to use it for something um, to let the band know, well, if it was someone that, that seemed negative, um, yeah, so... It's still kind of, I don't know if that's a very, that's not a very clear answer, but it's kind of like a mutual yeah. uh, respect, I would hope, yeah, so. Yeah, um, that, that sort of seems to make sense. It's it's always, it's always a funny one, you know, when people are, are taking photos and you go, oh, I've never seen that photo. I wonder what those look like, you know, <laughs> when you're from yeah, the person exactly. on stage, like, look at all these people taking photos. Are they just throwing those away? Are they going to use those yeah. for something while well, I ever see them? I hope it's good. Yeah, I, know. I wonder, I wonder yeah. what I look like, you know, but a lot of times Definitely. it just gets put, put on a I, file somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, uh, again, it's, uh, this is another thing that, um, from my like peak time of shooting live bands, for the most part, many of them were my friends. They were in the same scene and I would, sh you know, we'd have the opportunity to speak or they'd ask me and I'd show them or, you know, or if it was for a particular thing, I would show them. 
And then, you know, there's a lot of times I didn't get the opportunity to show them, and I'm still catching up now. Like, I'll oh, scan, scan photos and post them, and a band member will say, I never saw that. And I'll say, you know what? I never saw it either. What, here it is. What do you think? <laughs> so it's just like, <laughs> I don't know. I th- if, we're, Elsa, we're having a little a, bit of a connection issue. Could, are you hearing me okay, Pat? I, I'm having a little I, bit of a hard time hearing yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing you okay. Let me um, Yeah, oh, man. Let's see. Okay, it's, gonna, it's pretty broken up closer. on my side. I'm wondering. Let's see. Uh, wonder Let if me... there's anything to. Um, I'm gonna try closer to my uh, broad my Wi-Fi. See if that helps. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. No. No. <laughs> I, you I, should. I'm glad you told me. I'm like, oh no, it's starting to get to the point. Like. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. I'm happy to. Um, uh, start again too. It's no problem. Let's see. That should be, is that better? It's sounding a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's sounding it. pretty clear. It was. It was starting to get like the you know the the cell phone. The kind of robots. Air, 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 air. Yeah. Okay. There we go. How's that? Let's see. Check testing. I think one, that's two. better. Let's see. I've got a full bar showing on my side now, so no. Oh no. I wonder I wonder what's going on. It's it says uploading on mine. I don't know what that means. If it's trying to catch up with me or something. Your full bars full bars on your side, let's see. Yeah, but in the uh Riverside program it says sixty nine percent uploading. Recording. Oh, oh, that's oh, it's uploading. Okay. okay, I see that. I got, f- I got full Wi-Fi bars. Is it still Dr. Roboto, Mister Roboto? So. Oh, it's it's coming in and out. Let, we yeah. yeah, we can try to keep going. I know. Do you know? Um, uh, do you know Joe Plummer? Was he with Modest Mouse when you were out? Yeah, there? yeah, I know Joe Plummer quite it's well. Percussion. I, Yes, for sure. I, yeah, um, yeah. I, I I first met Joe when he was in. Um, was I can't even. Remember. I've I've known him for so long. I can't remember. Magic. Yeah, Magic ma- and uh, Blackheart Procession, and I think like the first oh, okay. time I photographed Joe Plummer, or I have a a portrait of Joe Plummer. It was um, uh, September tenth, in t- September tenth, two thousand one. Portland, Oregon, at the Crystal uh, Ballroom, you know, in the in the bathroom there. I just know that because uh, September eleventh, two thousand one, was quite a crazy time, and um, yeah, so the, oh, I, yeah. I know those roles pretty well. But that's when I first met Joe because I, 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 <laughs> I, maybe I met him before that, but we were, you know, I've been friends, and then I spent, you know, a few years on the road with him, with Modest Mouse, and yeah, he's great. I um obviously through the podcast yeah. his podcast well, he'll, he'll probably yeah. <clears throat> you know, he'll he'll probably be the one editing this oh, so this will be if he can make it work okay <laughs> well tell like you going, what like, oh you know, no Randy why did you let him keep talking okay. you couldn't hear him <laughs> um he you know I'm totally easy right I'm not uptight shit. so like yeah. if uh we need to redo this whole thing twice I don't care it's not going to bother me <laughs> you know, probably maybe okay. you'll get some better well, yeah, answers <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> we'll do a take two yeah, yeah well let's let's go and if it becomes unbearable then because mm-hmm. right now it's sounding good so okay if it's I don't get, know, if it gets I don't know bad the, ways of the magic of the, of yeah. the internet if it gets <clears throat> yeah, yeah. we'll just call it and then uh mm-hmm. we'll then we could try to reschedule for another time but yeah, yeah. no i think this is we're, we seem to be flowing here good <clears throat> but i did I did kind of want to start at the beginning. Like, tell me a little bit about where you know where you're from and how and how you first got interested in photography. Um, I'm from uh, a town called uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin, which is um, later. Well, it's it's famous for the fact that Les Paul was from there, kind of invented distortion, Ooh. all that from there. At least I thought that was cool, but now it's unfortunately famous for. Uh, Murder, kind of. <laughs> no, it's an alright place, but oh, there's no. some creepy shit that went on there with. I don't know. I won't mention that, but you can look it up. You'll see. Um, but anyways, okay. that, that's where I'm from, <laughs> and um, I got into photography when I was in eleventh grade, 
in high school because I really I was I really liked art and music, you know, and at, at that point, and then I you know, I thought I couldn't draw. And there was a photography class where you get access to a Pentax K1000 dark room and you get to roam around and take pictures so I thought perfect that's what I'm gonna do got that uh, roamed around took pictures developed them there and from the moment I first uh, developed those pictures you know in the dark room seeing the photo come up in the tray and the red light and everything that kind of got me hooked around and then at the same time I was going to um, punk gigs I just discovered or recently got into punk music. Previous to that, I was really into metal, like Ozzy and Metallica. <laughs> I saw some pretty iconic metal gigs back in the day in Milwaukee. And um, yeah, and I started taking pictures at shows. Went from there. Um, Fugazi, of course, loved Minor Threat. Fugazi came through, photographed them. And this is really early on. I was quite blown away. And then became hooked, like I had to photograph them as much as I could, and they came through again, and then, long story short, they, um, a gig they were doing in Wisconsin or in Milwaukee got canceled, so myself and a few friends decided that we would set up the gig ourselves, and in my head I was thinking, we've got to set up this gig, because how am I going to be able to photograph them if they don't play in this area? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we set up a gig that was kind of... Um, I guess famous for within a few people at the time because we rented out the local Waukesha like Expo Center, which in our heads we thought, you know, Fugazi, it's Fugazi, right? We need a big space, but this space is like huge, like 2,000 people, like a <laughs> dome. And we somehow, they got there and they're like, what the hell? This is like, so, you know, this is the place where, like, uh, you know, Trump would speak, or there'd be gun conventions or dog shows, oh, like, literally. So that, and then I became friends with him. Actually, previous to that, I was uh, writing and taking photographs for a zine in Milwaukee, and I met Ian McKay that way, and he stayed at my parents' house with Fugazi. And then we did that show, and they stayed again, became friends, and... I ended up going to D.C. for an animal rights march. Met people at Positive Force House, which is uh, where I eventually moved, and met Isaac Brock and uh, loads of other people within the uh, creative or in the community. And it went from there. Yeah. So. Wow. Wow. I mean, it sounds it sounds like a heady time. You know, what I mean, just the idea of like from seeing a show to then putting on a show. I mean, but that that was sort of that was the culture of of the time, right? Of the, the yeah. DIY sort of thing. From being a fan to like, hey, I want to help out. What can I do? And you're putting your hand up. Exactly. And, yeah. And, and I think yeah. Um. This uh, it goes. You know, earlier in this conversation or before, where you were talking, mentioned about the uh, you know DIY ethic and all of that, and um, that's for me, it was you know, punk, you know, it's like, oh, what do you mean? We can do it on our own. We can, we want this band to come, so they're going to come here, or you know, I'm going to write a letter to this group and speak for them. <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> if it's not happening, make it happen for yourself. So, um, yeah, and it went from there. Which, yeah. Very different than, yeah, you couldn't write a letter to Ozzy Osbourne and say, hey, I want you to come bite a, exactly. bite a head off you a know, bat in I, my town. And then, and then, you know, like going to a punk show, it's like I can get up really close and <laughs> all, of, all of that. So, yeah, you couldn't do that. So... That's incredible. And then, and then DC at the time, I mean, you were there, you know, you mentioned, you know, Riot Girl and, and, you know, you were sort of at, in a, in a type of cultural epicenter, you know, at, at that moment and having a camera on it just sort of, you know, uh, did that allow you, was there ever like, was there ever a, a feeling of distrust of somebody with a camera at there? Were you the kind of, were you the type of person to always have a camera just on you? And does it just seem normal that, that, oh, there's Pat, he's going to have a camera. I'll probably take my picture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, I think it, it did seem more for a lot of people, but also, um, you know, the way that I worked, uh, for the most part, I was even, you know, in those days, I was really, really focused on the on the music and the bands performing, I see. and then also any kind of protests or any kind of movements and um, things happening. It was less, you know, li you know, you can look back at however you work to, you know, art or music and you think, oh, I should have done this. You know, like there's things that, you know, like I didn't 
do like a whole series of portraits of certain people. But, you know, that said, there was different things I did for, you know, so eventually, yeah, I guess, yeah, now I think about it. But there was also other mm -hmm. photographers like Cynthia Connolly who were doing, yeah. kind of covering that area too. It sort of seemed yeah. like there was a scene almost of photographers as well as bands. Is, yeah, is that, yeah, exactly. You know, were, yeah, you're right. And it was, um, I mean, Cynthia, see, you know, when I met Cynthia, it was because we really both of, we both love photography and, you know, she, I was working at a camera store, you know, so I, I'm really open to, you know, collaborating and working with people. And Cynthia and I became friends and then we did a, a touring exhibition of our photos together that went around the U.S. for a couple of years, ended up in the U.K. And, you know, a large part of that, most of that was really organized and Cynthia is really good at that type of thing and also photography as well, of course. But, you know, that was, we worked together and I was also um, inspired by, you know, people like Jim Saw. He was doing a zine, so I, would con I contributed to his zine. Um, Jeff Nelson, you know, was design discord ads for example and i always love the mm -hmm. discord ads the non-band photo discord ads so i contribute to that and you know so it was very kind of it was a great community and very encouraging and that's why i ended up moving there really was because people saw that i loved the music loved what was going on it's like well why don't you just move out here I'm like okay so a friend <laughs> of mine from there drove out to wisconsin picked me up and i moved into Positive Force and sublet um, Mark Anderson's room, who was writing the book about Positive Force, or DC, I mean. Wow. So, um, and it was just, yeah, so, yeah, people are used to it, and I were, you know, and it was also, it was a mutual respect, um, so, you know, there may have been certain people with cameras that did things with the cameras or they took, you know, didn't respect the musicians, the artists, and I was looked down upon, obviously, and I had more respect for them. I am, um, you know, with Riot Girl and Bikini Kill early on, there was a lot of, like, media misinformation about what they were trying to do, and that really upset them, and I made a point not to, um, you know, get involved with that misinformation, and I even like um, NME and Melody Maker magazine somehow, or they got a hold of my Bikini Kill photos. I don't remember how, but they ran them without my permission, and it was really, oh, wow. uh, you know, I got them to apologize, and they called me at the time, and you know, so I always had that with them, and I think, um, you know, Sorry. that's so interesting. Sure that. Yeah, shut up, Alexa. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, the computer assistant. Yes. Uh, uh, wow, that's oh, that's amazing. And then and then then going from DC to then you know going on the road or or what was what was sort of the evolution of that like as you know from being in DC and and you you know the the f cover photo of the Bikini Kill release then did that what did things was there like a you know almost a career progression or what was your sort of uh, mission at, at that time or just continued continue doing what you were doing did you have a sort of thought about how you were evolving as an artist or sort of where you wanted to go as an artist yeah well I um well one thing I noticed I was you know I was photographing as many bands as I could possibly like I would go to as many gigs as I could and I was photographing every band even if I had not heard them, you know, but maybe someone said they were good. So I got to a point where um, I felt like all my photos were starting to look the same. Like, okay, here's a person with a guitar. Here they're doing the same thing as this other person with a guitar. And I, in my head, I, you know, I thought that um, there's so much more to music than this person performing on stage. There's a lot to this. So that's when I started to become interested in you know, their instruments, but also. I really like the idea of traveling with musicians and actually seeing that you know something else besides the East Coast and experiencing what they do and then documenting that, photographing that, um, you know. So moving more from you know still doing live performance and all of that, but taking it off the stage and you know doing what the dream, you know, driving around <laughs> the country. And um, I was fortunate enough that. My my roommate, or he was, 
he, uh, Isaac Brock, he said, you know, he made the, before he had a group, we were doing kind of strange photography projects, little color zine where he dressed up in outfits and I'd photograph him doing uh, things around Arlington and stuff. But it, it was, it was fun, right? And he said, yeah, we're going on tour. I want you to come out and take pictures and uh, we can do this all over the country, everywhere. So I thought, oh, yeah, that's great. And then from that that's point, then I went on tour with them and for the next uh, 10 years or something and then tour with other bands as well. And yeah. That's so cool. I, I never really think of, of Isaac Brock being a, from a, a, a DC sort of band or Moss Mouse being a DC band. Yeah, well, they're, they're not a DC uh, band. That's the thing. They, um, uh, Isaac, are you there? Uh, he moved out there when he, he had dropped out of high school and he was uh, moved to D.C. I think he was, yeah, he was 15. And we were both living in the same house. We lived together there for probably about a year, just under a year. And then at the time he was playing instruments, trying to learn to play. And then moved back out to Issaquah and then started a band. And then, you know, we kept in touch. I and, see. Yeah. So. Yeah. I see. Oh, okay. Okay. Wow. Oh, that's interesting. It's so funny that the DC sort of connection to so many things. All yeah. roads go through DC. Yeah. It was uh, at that time, especially, it was like there was a DC, there was a heavy uh, DC, Olympia, Seattle, kind of Portland connections, you know, even though they were so far away. And to do with, yeah. All of that. Why? Why do you think that was, or what was your experience of that sort of um, cross, cross think, continental sort yeah. of cultural bond? Uh, I think it was probably it was a lot to do with just um, like minds, uh, similar ideas. I mean, if you trace it back, I think it probably goes back to like Kelvin Johnson from uh, K Records. I think he lived in D.C. originally, or he was there or something. I don't know. It could be incorrect, but. So he was back and forth, and then people from D.C. going back and forth, and then, you know, Bikini, uh, Kathleen Hanna, people from Bikini Kill, they moved out to D.C., and you know, D Bikini Kill lived in D.C. for a while. And, you know, so that friends of friends that kind of built upon that. So, um, you know, there's all these big houses in D.C., group houses where everyone would live at, bands practice and do things, uh, interesting things. Yeah, I mean, just just from being on tour, I mean, there is a kind of similar type of energy, of almost like a it's one's you know sort of the nation's capital, one's the state capital, and then there's sort of just the sort of the loose sort of just towny sort of vibe around those big things. Like you're in, it's almost in the shadow of like the, the political bubble. Yeah, it's almost sort of seems a more permissive or sort of just more open minded you know sort of thing. Is also the you know Evergreen you know college sort of allows for that, and there's t and all the college and sort of forms of education. It's almost like finding the the shadow where no one's really noticing you, you know, where like New York, everyone's, you know, look all eyes on, on you or LA or these different types of places where, you, you know, the big city sort of like, you know, thing where versus these kind of smaller big cities where you can kind of hide out and sort of make your own mark. Yeah. You know, if exactly. I had to pull it a straw. But. And it was, um, you know, you've got that. And then people tended to like, you know, there was just a lot of encouragement, you know, so it's like, oh, yeah, I need a job. Okay, yeah, you can get, a, get it. Here's the, this bookstore. You can get a job over here, or why don't you do this at this place? Or, yeah, so it was like everyone kind of really helping each other out in this way. So yeah, I, mean, I had oh. people built. I had a dark room in my closet, you know, at the time. <laughs> um, Al, Alex Dunham, who was in Hoover, he built that dark room in my closet. Then I had dark rooms at different punk houses in D.C. and I just go over there in the middle of the night and print or, you know, so it was cool. Wow, that's incredible. And then and then, tell me a little bit about, and then, you know, the, the move to London and uh, 96 Gillespie mm -hmm. and sort of this next sort of, you know, yeah. uh, chapter in, in your journey as an artist. Yeah, well, I, um, I was saying we, I'd, I'd been going on a lot of tours and I also was also... I worked initially. I worked at Symbol Machines Records, which ran out of the house we lived in, and that the deal was I would do the mail order. They pay my rent, and then eventually I was working for Discord Records, doing things there as well. And Cynthia and I we did the photo exhibition, 
and it traveled to, it was going to the ICA in London and people from Southern Records, which is, a, which worked with Discord, they did distributing and they were yeah. like the, you know, all that stuff. And so when we went out, when I went over there, I met people at Southern and I met, um, this a person named Melanie Standish and she was helping, you know, she's doing like production art for them. And we, uh, she helped, she, she put one of my, my first photo on the internet. This is a long, a while ago. <laughs> and yeah, so we became friends and then going back and forth and we had similar interests in photography and art and design, all of that. And eventually I, um, was seeing her, got married to her, moved over to uh, London, and then we uh, got an old post office building and decided that we wanted to open a gallery with a that had a dialogue with American artists and UK artists, much like this mu music dialogue between musicians back and forth. And we did that, you know, so a lot of the art was based around um, art that came through music. You know, so for example, like um, G. Vaucher, who did all the art for Crass. We were, yeah. Melanie had worked with her, designing her first book. And so we had exhibition with her. And then I'd done a lot of work with, um, you know, with Rich Jacobs and was in loads of his move exhibitions from early on. So mm -hmm. we had Rich over and Tim Kerr came over <laughs> and yeah, lots of people from that. I'm trying to think who else, yeah. And, and then Rich, yeah, Rich had, you know, he had so many friends who are so he introduces, you know, people like, well, I knew like Thomas Campbell through Cynthia and then Rich. And then, um, yeah, so there's all these like connections. So that was, that was cool. That was, um, you know, and we did uh, collaborations with, um, Space 1026 in Philly, Philadelphia. Oh, yeah. And, Epic. and Epic needles space. and needles and pens out in California. So we had a really good thing going back and forth. And eventually that kind of wound down. And then I was... And what was it like being on that side of things versus, you know, so much in the trenches and on the stages and, and you yeah. know, on the road with bands and then just sort of settling down? How did you mm -hmm. find that that sort of speed and that sort of energy? I like that in a whole uh, different way. It was, yeah. um, it was just exciting to uh, hopefully uh, try to introduce people to these artists or get get their work seen. You know, within the community where we were in London and the meet, you know, the UK press, and then have the opportunity to meet some people that I hadn't met or spent time with people who I had respected in the art scene in the U.S. and the U.K. So that was, uh, yeah, that was really cool. Um, and I still, you know, all of these kind of connections you one built or I built through like DIY, music and art, there's still people I would, you know, um, collaborate with now or speak with now or still see now, you know, so... Wow. It was quite strong, you know. So it was a similar type attitude or feeling, minus the. It's so funny. Know, you know, oh, and sorry. The, and minus being on the road, you know. So. Yeah. But, oh. Are you there? I'm here. There you are. Yeah, okay, go sorry, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I just, just dropped out a few times. How's that? Um, oh yeah, yeah. I think we're good. Cool. Um, well, yeah, I'll I'll just keep rolling and like I said, I'll I'll show this to to. Uh, to Joe um, and so yeah. he'll, he'll yeah. I'll let him make the call of like, uh, yeah, yeah. I think we got, yeah, maybe totally. we might have to, to pick some stuff up, but, um, oh, I was just going to say, yeah, the Southern thing. It's so funny. You, you mentioned that she put, you know, first to put your photo on the internet. I remember the Southern website being one of the first kind of early internet sort of portals for a lot of, you know, that kind of punk DIY, you know, um, presence online. I used to go to Southern records.com and, or I think that's what it was called. And then, yeah. but they had a great like tour page. Yeah, like you, exactly. it was one of the first places yeah. prior to Pitchfork or prior to uh -huh. any other kind of like online media, like Southern Records website was the like place where you could see all these great bands that they distributed and and where all their tour dates were. It was like a big kind of like Excel spreadsheet. It totally. was like a huge sort yeah. of resource, show resource for somebody, you know, like me kind of living in the suburbs of Southern California. Like, okay, when when is Blonde Redhead going to be yeah. you know, anywhere <laughs> near LA? Okay, I'm going to find, oh, this is great. I can see six months out. Yeah. You know, the tour schedule for Super Chunk. Yeah. Or for, you know, the, the 
these you know all these touch and go mm-hmm. bands or all these merge bands or you yeah. know, discord bands it yeah it, it's exactly and they've got they had i mean i don't think they're they're not running anymore i think unfortunately but they um yeah they were southern records i mean john loader and um and then later allison uh, schneckenberg they were really behind a lot more than i think what people realize like going back to like crass and all of that you know which yeah. is where it kind of started but that kind of and then even drum and bass and just all this stuff that was involved with it you know it's pretty interesting so it's so cool yeah my band on our um i don't know, i think it was our second or third tour in the uk we had we had a, a few days off and our friend chris tipton from upset the rhythm a record label and promoter there he yeah. he uh, i was able to set us up with a day at southern studios and we recorded three songs on our first sub pop record there from at southern and it was incredible we were just i think we we had to kind of pick our jaw up off the floor you know for the first hour just kind of like oh uh, (laughs) how could we be here this is so cool that's all the bands that have recorded all the great records that were made there and then to and then just get down to business like okay well we we can't waste our time just nerding out yeah (laughs) sticker on every on every door panel like go to the bathroom like look who was here look who wrote this all the graffiti and stuff touch this yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) like okay let's let's start Mm -hmm. recording and we actually we got a couple songs done but yeah no it's, it's it's such a rich history, I think, you know, of kind of looking at that, those sort of the roots of so much of the, I don't know what it's called, you know, alternative music scene or DIY punk scenes, you know, t- can be traced back through through to the London and those and those bands there through, through yeah. you know, Southern and Crass. And, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, a, it's a incredible. And it's like, um, you know, for me, like you were saying, growing up in California, middle of nowhere, kind of, I, for me, it's similar in being in, Wisconsin, literally, like you know, nothing around. You know, no no internet. I just had to like pick up like Maximum Rock and Roll, or you know, write to the people I liked their music, and um, yeah, be, I was really surprised. I mean, at, at what I the response I got from all over the world in the in the punk scene, you know, at the time. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, yeah, there's there's people out there, like-minded individuals making their own art, you know. It's yeah, good to hear yeah. From people. Yeah, and then you know um, people who are you consider like big, you know, and then they write you back or you know you meet them. It's like okay, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that just happened. Okay, all mm-hmm. right, calm down. Yeah, I have I have one of one of my most embarrassing um, moments. I have I have a I have a very bad blurry uh, um, Polaroid of myself and Guy Pachotto in uh, in New York when uh, our band opened for uh, Casual Dots. Oh, and cool. uh, yeah. and and I had I had my friend like Could, uh, can, we, can I just take a photo and my friend couldn't quite get the Polaroid camera to work and I look like I'm about to cry I look like I'm 12 years old about to cry like oh, oh god I was probably I don't know we were probably I don't know 19 or no maybe we were 20 at that point 22 but uh, it was yeah it was one of the funniest I look I look back at that and like oh god you could just see this this man this poor man has so much patience for for kids like me bothering him. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not even a, I don't know. I mean, I can't speak for Guy, but I don't think it's, I don't think they, he or them thought of it that way, really, that much. Maybe at some point, maybe, yeah. But, um, yeah. Sure, it comes with the job, mm-hmm. being, a, yeah. being an icon. So these these yeah. things happen to you mm-hmm. over time. Um, and then, so tell me a little bit more now, as you know, you you mentioned, um, uh, teaching before we went on, like what are sort of, what's, what does some of the day-to-day stuff look like here? I mean, I'm looking, you know, my, the the most cursory lowbrow, you know, research of just going on to, uh, Wikipedia, you know, shows that, you know, your career has continued to grow as a photographer. I mean, what, how much of that do you, do you talk about or what, I mean, in in the sense of like, as being a hyphenate or somebody whose career as, you know, as as a photographer has grown over the years, like, what does that, what does that look like for you? and how has that experience been yeah well that it's interesting because you know if, if you think of you know this the idea of the hyphenate right within mm-hmm. photography you know or having a gallery all, all these other things but just even within photography there's for me it's always that it, that's always been a, a huge element of it and um i think that's for most a lot of photographers it's that way and you know it goes back to the um for me, as the music, it was something that I loved to do, and then other people, companies or commercial opportunities, arrived from that music. You know, they wanted something like it or something 
a better deal or whatever, and eventually, um, you know, selling prints to, for or, uh, for documentaries or licensing images and all of that. So there's this huge amount of different aspects of photography that I've dealt with over the past 30 or 25 years that um, a lot of, you know, you don't experience. It takes a while to get that experience. And so within that, I'm able to, uh, you know, share that knowledge or just give advice because I've experienced so much of it for in my teaching to people learning or wanting to learn about photography or learn about the possible business of photography, but really the more of the taking of the photographs and the different, you know, there's, there's kind of different stages that people go through if they consider themselves a, a photographer. So, uh, you know, all of that from, you know, I've photographed for you know, Premier, like Tottenham Hotspur Football Club, being on the pitch, you know, goals are being scored, and people freaking out, and <laughs> I had to photograph poker tournaments all over the world for a year. I did that one time. <laughs> it's just like ridiculous, <laughs> you know. So, and that, you know, so all of that but, kind of. But as a working professional, mm. as a working professional photographer, mm. you know, who sort of made your name or sort of cut your teeth in a live music sort of scene, it's it. It comes of it comes of a time you're like, well, I'm a professional photographer. I'm for hire. If somebody wants to hire me to shoot their, you know, their event, their team, their corporate, you know, sort yeah. of work. I mean, like like so many, you know, of us who grew up in a kind of punk DIY world, was there squaring of the circle kind of feeling, or mm. what? What was your relationship, or how did that thought go in terms of like, just well, this is my job. If I'm making if I'm making a living doing something that's creative with a camera in my hand, this counts as as you work or you know or how do you yeah. what, what has that experience been for you and obviously you know we're, we're all in the same sort of boat yeah i think i mean it's it's i'm not a musician but i've can say that most of my close friends are musicians and i've been around them i see what they've experienced and i think it's probably a similar thing so you know as a working photographer at any kind of uh, creative output like that. A lot of the work for me came through and comes through people I know within whatever that business is or somebody decides, oh, you know, they, they loved Fugazi, so they're going to hire me for some other random thing that they do because <laughs> of something else, wanna, right? And that they that's... They talk to you about Fugazi. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's great. But that's very rare, you know, but when it happens, it, it happens. It's great. But it's also... Um, being a you know per, if you can you know considering myself a professional photographer, I guess that's if I'm paid for certain things. It's also very difficult because um, you know honestly, people any kind of in this time that we're living in, it's you know it's like okay, I could have one day I've got you know this job I'm getting like sixty k you know something ridiculous amount of money yeah oh yeah oh yeah cool cool and then. Then I'm not at all. I'm getting zero, you know, so I don't have any kind of stability. And um, yeah, so that can be quite difficult. I think a lot of people, uh, younger people getting into it, or I think pe people should consider that as well. But it's, a, you know, um, yeah, I'm not yeah. trying to be so negative about it, but it's, you know, the brutal truth is that, you know, if you're an artist or whatever, you've got to really hustle <laughs> so. yeah well it's a gig mm -hmm. economy right which yeah, is kind of what you is. know i think so many uh, people are more comfortable with that term now mm -hmm. but you know it wasn't didn't really exist it was sort of just, yeah i feel like you hustle from one job to another to another yeah yeah nice. and yeah it's it's it is so interesting but how is you know and i see you know you sell you sell prints on on the big cartel does does that does that do well is that part of the, the picture or no or is that more just yeah. a connection to the fans a sort of portal for people well, who are fans at a particular time a little both like i think yeah. it's um you know i sell prints on there and i've got a lot of a few different projects in the pipeline hopefully but they um you know to be honest that's quite that's also that can be quite difficult just because mainly well for me personally you know, I've got like, I have ADHD and dyslexia and so I'm not, 
always focused on the things I should be focused on. And, you know, so sometimes, you know, someone orders a print and it takes a long time for me to just get it sorted, <laughs> which it shouldn't, but it does. Yeah. And then so if people aren't patient, they can get quite angry. But it doesn't happen that well. often. But, you know, so it, I, I guess it could be more, you know, than it is. I would hope it would be more. And at the moment, I'm, it's just learning that those things about myself and then looking at my past catalog and seeing the limitations I had early on with, you know, we're talking about getting photos, you know, someone's taking pictures of the band, like, we're, let's see them, you know. So... I would look at my old negatives and choose three or four shots and then find all the rest of them too difficult to print in the dark room or not do anything with them. And it's a big pile, right? Now I'm able to scan them, trying to organize, so I'm attempting to organize everything and that's becoming a whole new kind of uh, vision of this old work. Ooh. That's, uh, you know, you could call it nostalgia, but I, I call it, it's kind of new. I had a conversation with a friend about this recently about you know being able to see something you couldn't see before from something that was created a while ago because i'm quite interested in things like that so that's what i've been doing but yeah i guess i don't what i'm trying to say is yeah the big cartel the prints um there are some prints up there and i would lo i love people to purchase them and I, i'm just i guess i just ask everyone to try to be patient with me on that so that's, that's, the, well, that's the beauty of, of you know buying something directly from the artist you know yeah, even if it exactly. takes a while like you know it's it's mm. coming directly from the artist their hand it's not like you're a giant corporation you're not yeah, uh, yeah. print on demand uh yeah. ebay store or yeah. amazon store or something yeah. where you can just yeah i mean you want prints, it on the coffee mug do you yeah. want it on a keychain do you want it on a mouse yeah. pad do you want exactly it on i mean there is a place <laughs> for those type of things and maybe i'll do that but yeah. i mean for the moment i, I do uh, you know i have my prints made i make them and I sign them, and then I ship them. And I ship them in That's awesome. packaging that could look absolutely insane, but it's recycled, you know? <laughs> I'm, I'm not. That's the way it is. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty good for the most okay. part. I guess right now at the moment, yeah. I, it usually happens where I get friends will order stuff from me. It doesn't mm -hmm. usually happen, but it has happened. And I want to give them something super special, the best thing, whatever, a really cool thing. But that's a mistake, isn't it? Ends up taking me a lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> well, so. it sounds like yeah, you, mm -hmm. you've probably received packages from Thomas Campbell, and uh, mm -hmm. nothing you can ever send after that is ever touches whatever he does. You exactly know, right. Yeah, I think I have one. pieces of paper, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, sewn together, and you know, yeah. money from Istanbul or something sh shredded totally, into there. Like, right? oh god, okay. Yeah, now I have yeah. to mail a package back. Uh, yeah, hold on, I got. Uh, yeah. What do I <laughs> have a grocery <laughs> note? Hold on, I'm gonna flip mm -hmm. this grocery store note over and yeah. draw a little house on it so. yeah that's, that's incredible wow well thank you so much pat for taking the time i'm i, I apologize for our, our poor connection at moments mm -hmm. i may have to put uh, uh mr joe Plummer on this uh, forensic audio and maybe i'll come back and we can yeah. pick up a, we can do some inserts yeah, totally, if totally. we need to if there was something that didn't work but yeah um, but have do, a yeah. listen to it and uh yeah let me know i mean i'm happy to yeah. um if, if you guys are happy with it if i don't know if he sends it out beforehand if um i could get a listen to it or i sure. don't know just to make sure i don't sound like an insane person um <laughs> that's so. i don't that that's a that's a big that's a big feat i don't know if i don't yeah. know if Joe's capable of doing that yeah. but um and, um but I oh just, well, i will say before we sign off though yeah we mentioned the big cartel which is um let me see if I can pull it up here. It is patgram.bigcartel.com. Uh, but is there any other places you want people to follow you or to people to, mm. to, to, get, to reach out or get in touch if they're interested yeah. in what you're doing, if they're first learning about you or, or, or interested to know more about you? Where do you want people to go? Uh, yeah, I just at the moment, Instagram, really. I mean, the, okay. the big cartel thing, it, it's, um, that's where at the moment, that's where my platform at the moment, but I, I'm kind of yeah. trying to fine tune that and working some things out with a, a few different people that I've done a lot of work with that hopefully more uh, near Christmas, I may, things may be coming up through different channels, but if you follow me on Instagram, you'll see it on there and you can always what? email me there or just, um, yeah. What is your Instagram yeah. handle? It's uh, Instapatgram. 
beautiful. And if you want a a giant framed black and white photo of your favorite band Mm. for Christmas, uh, now is a good time or the next couple months by, by, by by Thanksgiving, (laughs) reach out for your significant other, your partner in life who needs that, uh, that Toby Vale photo, (laughs) that uh, Ian Mackay photo in in their big living room. Uh, Yeah. uh, That's (laughs) awesome. Well, thank you so much, Pat, for taking Mm -hmm. the time. I really appreciate it. It's been an honor to, to speak with you. Um, Yeah, thank you. Dude, how iconic was that? Mr. Pat Graham. I mean, I've been looking at some of those images that he captured for decades. And he really defined the look and feel and some of the iconography of entire scenes or bands' careers. I was really honored to get to speak with him. I hope you dug the conversation. Um... That's really it. I will see everybody on Monday. Hope you have a good weekend. Stay safe. Go ahead. Leave us five stars. And uh, (laughs) it just doesn't sound right. I don't even think it is five stars. I don't know how you rate things. I don't know what these things work. But but I appreciate you being here and listening. If you want to tell people, you can. I would enjoy that. I think they would enjoy that if they like this kind of thing. Um, share these episodes with your friends, your families, your loved ones. I think I'm really popular with grandmas. So tell your grandma, call her this weekend. She wants to hear from you anyway. And tell her, tell, tell her about this great podcast you just heard with Pat Graham. She wants to know. Tell your grandma about Graham. Graham.